الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم أما بعد respected listeners السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله once again joined us for the Q&A question and answer session and inshallah we'll begin with this week's questions question number one some surahs have multiple names how do we know this why don't we take the literal name mentioned in the Holy Quran so in the Holy Quran surahs that have names surah Baqarah surah Ali Imran surah Tawbah and so on some surahs have other names also which the Mufassirin have mentioned in the books of Tafsir. An example is Surah Tawbah. Another name for Surah Tawbah is Mukhziya, the one that disgraces. Now, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the ill qualities of the hypocrites in Surah Tawbah, and which is related to the topic in Surah Tawbah, Allah has described them. So for this reason, the Mufassirin have mentioned that another name for it is Mukhziya. So any Surah that has another name is all is, is always related to that Surah what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned. But usually the names that are written in the Quran, that is the name of the Surah. And they can have a few other names also which the Mufassirin have mentioned. Number two, what do al muqattaat letters mean? Is there anyone with the knowledge of this or is it a secret? Firstly, what is huruf al muqattaat Are those letters like alif lam mim, ha mim, ya sin, kaf ha ya ayn sad, Noon, these letters that appear in the Quran, sometimes they come in the beginning of a surah. Like Surah Baqarah, Alif Lam Mim, and then all the Ha Mims that we find in the Quran. Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ain, Sad. So they come in the beginning of the surah. Now, does anyone have the knowledge of this? The Mufassirin, they mention. Regarding the huruf al muqattaat Allahu a'lamu bi muradihi bi dhalika amanna wa sadda. That such letters, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what they mean, and that's what we believe. Some have tried or made an effort to try and say, what does alif mean? What does lam mean? What does mean mean? But in general, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what it means what these letters huruf al muqattaat mean number three what should one do when they visit a grave when one goes to the graveyard the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has mentioned in a hadith that when one goes to the graveyard then it reminds them of death just like the person that is in the grave there was a time when they were on the earth just like we are but then the time came and now they've gone so it's a lesson that we have to die one day it's a reality so it reminds one of death so it's very beneficial when one goes to the graveyard number two they read the dua which our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has mentioned which is in the books of hadith one should read the dua number three if one decides to convey Isa uh, al-Sawab to do uh, to convey the word, then this is also fine. They can recite Ayatul Kursi Al Fatiha and make the intention that may Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala give this reward that one has earned that reaches the deceased. Number four, make dua for them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate the status. May Allah thank 
and may Allah forgive their shortcomings. So these are some things which one can do when they go into a graveyard. Number four, what was the complexion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It's written in the books of Sirah. Our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was fair and he had some reddish also in his skin. Our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his hair was not too straight, it was not too curly. He had beautiful black hair which reached his earlobes and at times it went to his shoulders. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his pupils, they were dark black. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face would glow, subhanAllah, more beautiful than the moon. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had his skin was very soft. A companion says that it was more softer than silk. Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu say, I have not seen anyone like this. So our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and how he looked, subhanAllah, is all collected in the books of Sirah, which would go into a long discussion. So I've just mentioned briefly a few points. Another miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he was neither too tall, neither too short. And a miracle was if he would stand next to a person that was tall, then it, it would not appear that he would look short. Subhanallah. So th these are a few points that I've mentioned. And there's a lot of detail in the books of Hadith regarding the appearance of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number six, number five, who are the Sahaba? The Sahabas are those that seen our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They accepted Islam and they died in the state of Iman. They are known as a Sahabi. Some of them spent more time with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some of them spent less time. Likewise, the Tabi'i is one who has seen a companion and died in the state of Iman. Number seven, can I go out without taking permission from my husband? Now generally with regard to ladies, many have had discussions and some now the Billah they object and they go to the extent and say that Islam has put so much thickness on ladies. Yet without studying the detail and the laws which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set, there is a lot of wisdom in this. Regarding going out without the husband's permission, if a wife goes out, her husband should know where she is. And that is part of the etiquette. like a husband goes out, the wife knows where is my husband. Has he gone to the shop? Is he at work? Where is he? And it saves from the things of shaitan also. That if a husband does not know where his wife is, then shaitan can put all kinds of things in his mind. So they should know where the whereabouts is, that where the wife is. And even if, it, if the wife needs to go out somewhere, she would know, is my husband happy with this or if he is displeased with this. The general rule which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned is for ladies that they should remain in their homes. That is their safety and a lot of hikmah and wisdom is in this command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like I remember there was a famous boxer, Muhammad Ali, and he became a Muslim and he explained to his daughter and explained to her that look that you are very precious and precious things they are kept safe and they are hidden so likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this status to the ladies that they are precious and this is this is how they should be and if they do go out, then they should follow the guidelines and the teachings of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But they should, the husband should know where his wife is. 
and it's important uh, wherever she's going inform the husband is part of the etiquette also and inshallah if they follow this then inshallah there will be no uh, arguments or doubts that can creep up in the husband's mind and if such things are not practiced then the husband shaitan can whisper such things in the mind of the husband and such things can creep up so to inform each other is very good and that is the best way forward inshallah some sisters may think that we are in prison that is not the case the freedom and the rights that islam has given to the ladies no nothing other than other religion has given but we have to, the condition is we have to understand them rights. We have to understand the value that Islam has given to a woman and the rights that Islam has given to a woman. And if we understand them, then surely that we would agree with this. Number eight, can you explain ayah number 22 in Surah Hajj? Ayah 22 in Surah Hajj Kullama aradu an yakhruju minha min ghammin u'idu fiha wa dhuqu adhab al-hariq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains about the people that will be in the hellfire Now because of the torment and the punishment of the hellfire They will try and escape So they can see that there is a way out but so they will try and escape but every time they try this grief that they have and they will try but there's no way for them that they can go out so this is to increase their grief more that they can see that there is a way where, where, uh, that is out there's a door but yet they cannot get there and whenever they try Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they will be returned back and they will have to face this burning punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even their attempt will not be any benefit and even the attempt that they try and make, it will increase their grief because there's no way that they can get out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all from the fire of hell. Number nine, can we do Jummah namaz at home during lockdown? Regarding Juma, the scholars have advised that one should not do Juma at home during the lockdown and there's a number of reasons that have been mentioned and even if some people get together then one of the reasons that the scholars mention that even after we come across this situation then what will happen is pe it could drift people away from the masjid and think okay there's less time i'll just offer it wherever is possible yet Jummah prayer should be offered in the masjid in a large masjid number 10 when a person dies people like to gather and recite al-fatiha but i have read somewhere that this is bid'a and also 40 days after a person has passed they like to do khatam. Is this also a bid'ah? If so, what should one do after someone in their family has passed away? Very good question. If you want to see someone, how much deen do they practice or the knowledge that they have is at the time when they are happy and at the time when they're in grief. When a person is happy, they're getting married, then will they give priority to their deen or priority, priority to baseless customs? Or giving priority on spending a lot of money just to please others? And the same thing happens when someone passes away. Such things are done just to please others. Now when a person passes away, if one wants to convey reward to them, pass on reward to them, when they have earned this reward themselves and ask Allah 
that made this reward pass on to them, then there is nothing wrong with that. This is fine and this can be done. But some of the practices that we find in the society when someone passes away, that we have fixed certain things in Deen which are not part of Deen. So there's a method and a way which is Sunnah, which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. Or what his Sahabas and his great companions had done. So we have to follow what the Prophet ﷺ had done, what he had taught us. So Sunnah is something which will be the same everywhere. It doesn't matter where we go around the world. But if there's innovations, then it will always be different in different places. So if the family members mm -hmm. want to recite or read Quran, of course they can read Quran. There's nothing wrong with that. But to fix days, after three days, after 40 days, they gather people, they get them together, and then they will finish one khatam, a full Qur'an, or they'll do it once a year. They have fixed things into Sharia, which is not part of Sharia. Our deen and ibadah is something that we do daily. We recite Qur'an daily. We recite Qur'an, it's not something which we do every three days or 40 days or once a year. We should recite Qur'an every day. So if we point such things and think after the person has passed away, after three days, after 40 days, after one year, that we will get people, collect them together. And then what happens is we've added things on into deen. Then they would get together and then maybe they recite Qur'an and then they think it's necessary that we have to inform the Imam we have read 10 Qur'ans. Allah knows what we have read. Allah is the one that gives a reward. And Allah knows what our intention is. It's not something which is a must compulsory that you have read 10 Qur'ans. And if you do not inform the Imam that you have read 10 Qur'ans or Ayat Karima thousands of times, then the reward will not be conveyed. Allah has not put such restrictions. We have put these restrictions. We have put these conditions. And then there's a food that is served after. If we ponder and think and add these things and make them into a custom, not everyone can afford maybe to feed 100 or 200 people. And then the question arises, what is their intention for feeding them? Why are they feeding them? And then the other question comes where they place the food in front of the Imam and they say, make dua on the food. Or read some dua. And then they'll remove the food. If this, is not, if this is not done, then it becomes an issue. It becomes a problem. So where have we brought all these things from? Until this act is not done, we, we will not accept that this is a khatam. Or it will not be accepted. So such conditions have been brought into this. And the list goes on. So if a poor person, one of their family member has passed away. And they cannot afford to feed people. But they would still have to do this because people will talk. And they will say that such such person, he didn't feed people. Why did he need to feed 200 people? when he could have donated that money in sadaqah, in charity, and got reward for that, and then he could send the reward, convey the reward to the deceased. The Prophet ﷺ mentions the best type of charity is water. So rather than spending all this money on the food, they could maybe sponsor a child that is doing Memorizing the Quran. They could donate the money to orphans. They could have got a well in the name of the deceased until the, this water 
is flowing and is carrying on, the disease would get the reward. Does this not seem more beneficial? So there's so many things that can be mentioned and the topic will go on, on this discussion. And then the point comes where we force the Imam, that the Imam must come and he has to do this. And they force you, they say, you, you must do this. So it's our responsibility to teach our family what deen is, what Islam is. And when it comes to the ruling that someone has asked this, then we, will, we have to tell them what is right and what is wrong. So there's, no, there's nothing wrong with reading Quran. No one would issue a statement against that. But it's the other things that we have added on. And we have made them necessary. This is where the matter and the problem comes. Making such things necessary, adding them into deen. And if we cannot stand up, what will people say? We cannot look at what will people say, what will Allah say first? What did Allah's Prophet ﷺ teach us? That is number one and it will come first. So some of the points that I've mentioned may be offensive to some, but what is right and what is part of deen is an amana, is a thus, is something that we have to spread. What is the truth? At times, many youngsters, they ask me, so I try and tell them, this is what the right thing is. Someone has passed away. So what should one do? Give some, read Quran, do good deeds. The children, whatever good deeds that they do, without anything, the reward will go to the deceased, their parents. And if they want to give something on behalf of them, there's plenty of options, many places where it's the time of social media. How many clips do we see of hungry children, of people that struggle and have no water? We see these clips and they are sent to us. But we wouldn't divert our attention towards them, the people that are suffering with our water and food. And during the winter, they do not have basic necessities. But we would rather spend on other things so that we don't get a bad name in our family. So there's many things that can be said. So I'll just stick to the basic points that I've mentioned. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to follow the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Question number 11. For an accepted Hajj, there is no reward besides Jannah. How about if someone has an accepted Hajj but commits sins before death? So if one has performed Hajj, and as our beloved Prophet ﷺ has mentioned, the one that performs Hajj, then he's free from sins just like a child is born. So we have a clean sheet, there's no sins. But after if we commit sins, then we are liable. It will be noted down as a sin. And if we have passed away without doing tawbah, then we are liable for punishment. So any sin that is committed after Hajj, yes, it will be classified as a sin. If it's a major sin, it will be classified as a sin. And as this question is asked, it makes me wonder and think maybe this is one of the reasons in the general public, people like to go for Hajj in the, when they are old. Because maybe they think, if we have performed Hajj, then it doesn't matter what happens, what we do after that, we will go straight into Jannah. So that is not the case. If a person commits a sin, a sin, although they've performed Hajj, then it will be classified as a sin. Number 12, if the government has granted that a female over 45 to go for Umrah without a mahram, what is the Islamic ruling about this? If one has no mahram and goes to Hajj, would they be accepted? 
The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in a hadith that a lady should not travel without a mahram. So that is the basic rule: a lady when she goes out, and there's a lot of safety and protection in this, a lot of wisdom. So a lady should go with her mahram when she travels. However, if she's gone without a mahram, then that would be a sin. But will the Hajj be accepted? In law, the Hajj will be done. But the sin that is committed, it will be classified as a sin. So the certain conditions for Hajj to be done, the things which are wajib, the things which are fathers, if they are done, the Hajj will be done. But the reward will be lacking. And a punish and, and a sin for going without a mahram. Just as if a person has haram wealth and they go to perform hajj and they've done the faraid of hajj, the compulsory acts and the wajibats, the hajj will be done but they will have no reward. So, likewise, in this similar situation, that a lady. She should have a mahram and travel, a lot of safety and protection in this if we follow the sunnah and the guidance of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to understand and to spread unto others. Ameen. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.